Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm Rick. This is Anthony. Uh, we've been personal friends for some years now, in addition to toiling in the same vineyard <laughs> as uh, wo World War II uh, authors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we thought this morning we would have a conversation about uh, some of our experiences as writers about uh, uh, D-Day in particular, the Normandy campaign, and writing about World War II. And then certainly uh, open it up, hoping, hoping that uh, you'll have some questions or comments. We'll leave plenty of time for that. Um, so we thought maybe we would start, um, if it's okay with you, Anthony. We talked briefly yesterday in another panel about some of the characters that leap out at us at, uh, as writing about uh, the longest day. Uh, I talked a bit about Eisenhower. Uh, you talked about Montgomery. We could sit here and talk about Montgomery for 45 minutes and never <laughs> run out of stories. One of, one of my favorites is when uh, the campaign in North Africa was ending and a German general named von Thoma had been captured and Churchill was informed that Montgomery had agreed to have lunch with Thoma before he was dragged off to the POW camp. And Churchill said, poor Toma, I too have dined with Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's... Yeah, well, what about, sorry, qu quickly on this one. Um, even worse, actually, uh, we, uh, General de Gaulle got his revenge because Monty, as you know, was a famous anti-smoker. And de Gaulle turned up at Montgomery's headquarters uh, in Normandy. And he and his entourage uh, puffed uh, Goulois' tobacco <laughs> smoke at Monty for about uh, two hours all over lunch. And I think Monty must, uh, must have been ex asphyxiated. Well, there's another great, not to linger on M Montgomery too long, but uh, there, there's another Monty smoking story where he supposedly told Churchill, I neither smoke nor drink and I am 100% fit. And Churchill replied, I smoke, I drink, and I am 200% fit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we can circle back to Montgomery as need be. So wh who else would we want to talk about? If, if the stage were bigger and we could bring back the dead, which is what you and I do as mm -hmm. narrative uh, nonfiction writers, who else would you have here? L let's, let's talk about Rommel for a minute. How about Rommel? Rommel was the Army Group B commander. He's the uh, uh, commanding general of that section of France where the invasion hap happens to occur. Um, He's probably the most famous and enduring of, the, of all the German generals from the war. What did he do wrong? What did he do right in your estimation? Um, in the desert, um, he was a very rash commander. Um, and then there were several times where he could have actually defeated the British even more effectively. I mean, he certainly gave them a, a, a run for their money. But a lot of that was due to the effectiveness of the 88 millimeter gun, which frankly was knocking out the British tanks before they could even get within range. Um, and so he relied on that uh, to a large degree. But in fact, his um, method of attack often was uh, completely sort of disproportionate. And many of his uh, officers were furious at the way that um, excess, uh, excess casualties were, were caused uh, in that way. I think that he was much more, um, if you like, grounded by the time that he was Army Group Commander in Normandy. By then, his illusions had certainly uh, been uh, shattered, any illusions over Hitler. Uh, it was Rommel who used to refer to going to Hitler's headquarters and getting what he called a sunray cure, which mm -hmm. was when Hitler sort of said everything was fine and managed to persuade people that not to, uh, not to worry, everything was going to turn out all right. Rommel, by that particular stage, was very um, pessimistic and was more or less quite close to joining the resistance, but not entirely. What was more surprising, in a way, was sort of Bittrick, the uh, commander of the SS Second Panzer Corps, um, was also fairly close to um, believing that they should actually turn against Hitler and declare some sort of truce with the Allies at that particular point. So, um, but in, in Normandy, on the whole, Rommel um, was as right as he could be in the circumstances, which was uh, he felt that there was no point uh, keeping the panzer divisions right back as uh, Schwepenberg and uh, Rundstedt wanted to do for a, a massive panzer counterattack against the Allied landings. 
Uh, and instead, he felt that their only chance was to keep them forward, because by then, Rommel was um, pretty clear or pretty sure that the attack was going to come in Normandy and not in the Pas de Calais. Hitler, of course, was, uh, in his own typical way, uh, kept on changing his mind whether it's going to be the Pas de Calais or Normandy, so he could say afterwards, I was right, you see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he always tried to do that, so that he was never, ever wrong in any of his predictions. Um, but when it came to the final crunch of uh, the decision of where the Panzer Division should be, um, of course, there were so many different cross loires in the chain of command, uh, with Hitler not allowing any, uh, any form of sort of autonomy uh, from the front commanders that uh, uh, Rommel really didn't stand a chance in actually running the battle in the way that he wanted. And of course, one of the problems with keeping the Panzer Reserves back, as Rommel certainly recognized, exactly. having, yeah. having been subjected to Allied air superiority in North Africa, was that when it came time to move those tanks to the, uh, the, to the, the beachheads, mm. uh, you had to run the, the, the gauntlet of uh, Allied air power, you had to get across bridges that had been blown, uh, and all of that came true in the, in the long run. Uh, Rama was close enough to, uh, to joining the resistance to, of course, have it cost him his life. Yes. Um, as, as many of you know, Rama was uh, severely wounded when his staff car in Normandy, a bit later after the invasions in June, was caught by British uh, fighter planes. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was home recuperating in Germany. Um, it's not clear that he would have come back into the war in any meaningful fashion. He was so badly wounded. Uh, when uh, an ominous car arrived from Berlin with uh, orders to Rommel to kill himself or to be dragged back to Berlin for execution, and his family would also be subject to punishment, and so he committed suicide at that time. Um, so who else do we want to talk about? I'm, I'm struck by, the, um, by some of the secondary characters at Normandy uh, who reveal the, the inconstancy of war. So for example, two examples that I can think mm -hmm. of. Don Moon, Rear Admiral, US Navy, graduated highness class from Annapolis, was a very fine sailor, an extremely fine navigator, a very smart man. He had invented a kind of slide rule that was still used uh, after the war at, uh, at the Naval Academy. And he was the naval commander for the landings at Utah Beach on the far right of the invasion force. He was that good. He had been put in charge of that force landing there and did quite well, did uh, well enough to uh, then be given uh, a large command when the invasion occurred in southern France, Operation Dragoon. Mm -hmm. Moon was the naval commander uh, for this invasion that occurred on August 15, 1944. Just before it occurred, Moon called for his steward in his cabin on his flagship in Naples. Stuart brought him a glass of orange juice. Moon said thank you and blew his brains out. Left four kids, I think. Left a note. Post-traumatic stress of the first order. So you see in somebody like Moon... The pressures of command. The pressures of command. That's yeah, exactly yeah. right. Who else would you think in that... Well, I think that Ramsey was a very impressive yeah, uh, I agree. naval commander. Um, absolutely furious with Monty later, as we know, over the whole question of the failure to open Antwerp and secure the north bank of the Scheldt. Um, but, I mean, his, uh, the planning, I think, for Neptune, for the naval side of Operation Overlord, um, was, frankly, um, perfect. I mean, it was immaculate. Uh, there were lots of jokes at the time. It was known that the Canadians referred to it as Operation Overboard because yes. they were getting <laughs> several <laughs> volumes of sort of orders and instructions. But I mean, the, uh, the planning was um, absolutely extraordinary in its uh, detail and its foresight and all the rest of it. What was not well thought out, if you like, was the next stage. And we, here we have back to Montgomery, I'm afraid, but I think it's important. Montgomery saying that we, we are definitely going to must capture Caen in the first 24 hours. Um, but I always find a complete paradox in the way that he then organized his troops, because if you were going to go flat out to capture the Caen in the 24 hours, you should have had sort of armored battle groups uh, with the infantry not on their feet, but actually yeah. uh, in uh, um, half-tracks or mm -hmm. the British equivalent in a way, the kangaroos and things like that. 
Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't organized. AKA, yes, it was a much higher tide and all the rest of it, and they couldn't get off the beaches uh, uh, as soon as they could. So there did seem to be a um, huge concentration in the planning on the actual D-Day itself, which on the whole, with of course the exception, as we know, of Omaha Beach and all the rest of it, um, went far better than expected. In fact, um, there is an illiberal truth that uh, far more that more French civilians were killed on D-Day than Allied soldiers, yeah. uh, which is something we tend to, tend to overlook. That's right. And the French, in fact, have been willing to overlook it to some extent. To, to a very large extent. I mean, what I found chattering when I looked into it rather um, in rather more detail was that actually more French civilians were killed by British and American ordnance um, than British killed by the Luftwaffe. Yeah. And to circle level. back to Ramsey for just a minute, Admiral Ramsey, who is... Uh, Quite close to Eisenhower. Yes. Eisenhower. Oh, no, they got on very well. They got on very well, and Eisenhower relied on them a lot. And another tragic figure killed in a plane crash yes. uh, later that year. And uh, it was a blow to Eisenhower, partly because not only did he rely on Ramsey's competence, but he relied on Ramsey's wisdom, his counsel. Mm. Uh, he relied on him as an ally against Montgomery. Mm. So once again, another figure that I would mention is, uh, is then Brigadier General Norm Cota. Yeah. Who played him in the movie The Longest Day? I don't remember. Um, but Coda, very capable soldier, when they're jammed up at Omaha Beach and men are being slaughtered uh, uh, without ever getting out of the tidal zone, really, Coda is one of those smoking a cigar, waving his pistol, who basically is getting them off the beaches and up the, the, the slopes there. And he did extremely well. I think he, uh, you know, he rose to the moment, as so many did there, and performed heroically. And then he is given command of the 28th Infantry Division. He's promoted to Major General Two Star. 28th Infantry Division had been the Pennsylvania National Guard. And they're given the honor of marching through Paris after Paris is liberated in late August of 1944. And in fact, there are famous photos of the 28th Division marching on the Champs-Élysées. Mm -hmm. uh, these are Coda's men, and it was made into a postage stamp, a three-cent stamp. Yes. The next thing you know, Coda is in the Hurtgen Forest in the fall of 1944, one of the most terrible bloodlettings mm -hmm. in the entire war, where his division is shot to pieces, thousands of casualties to no good end very poorly managed tactical battle, disastrous operational battle, one American division after another thrown into the Hurtgen. Coda came within a, a whisker of being relieved by Eisenhower for incompetence, and really the only reason he was not relieved was so many junior officers had been killed or wounded, there was nobody to take his place. And it has always struck me that Coda represents that extraordinary fickleness of war uh, where you see a man who does so well and is decorated and lauded at Normandy, marches through Paris in late August, and the next thing you know, he's vilified as an incompetent uh, a couple months later. Mm. Well, was, uh, we know who the real responsibility, and that lay with um, First Army. Um, uh, with Hodges, the with commander. General Hodges. That's exactly um, right. And, you know, the total lack of imagination of that particular plan um, well, was, was enough to make you weep that yeah. uh, Kota, was, Kota was made the scapegoat. Yeah. Kota was a scapegoat, and many, many men died and were, were wounded badly as a consequence. Just one moment, um, uh, but it, it's partly because of the French angle, which is always interesting, of course, it was de Gaulle who had actually asked for that American division to march through Paris. In fact, he wanted two divisions to march That's through right, Paris. That's right, yes. Because, of course, at this stage, one has to remember how close Fran France was to civil war. Yeah. Um, I mean, in large areas of the country, down in the southwest, the battle between the milice, the extreme right, those who'd supported Vichy and all the rest of it, and the resistance was really very intense indeed. And the communist rising in Paris, uh, which forced the Gaullists then to follow them in um, the setting up of the barricades and all the rest of it, um, put, um, put the uh, whole, if you like, uh, government, uh, the provisional government of, uh, led by um, de Gaulle in a very dangerous position. Now, fortunately, the communists followed their own 
uh, shall we say, slogans, and they believed that you know by seizing power in the streets uh, they would take control and be able to launch a revolution in Paris. Uh, but actually, the girls' strategy was much cleverer. They seized the buildings, um, the really symbolic, important buildings, um, and it was the reason for, if you like, knowing that with the Second Armored Division, the Deuxième DB of General Leclerc, uh, which was in Paris, that the uh, American commanders were not going to allow that to stay there. Uh, de Gaulle wanted to have, if you like, a show of force through Paris um, to make sure that the communists wouldn't try anything else on. And interestingly, it was Stalin who uh, actually told the French communists not to cause any trouble because the one thing he didn't want to lose was Lend-Lease. He knew perfectly well the Americans would be so damned angry if there was a communist uprising. So we do have sort of this sort of interesting little triangular t power play. Um, and Maurice Torres, who was the communist leader in uh, Paris, was actually ordered by uh, Stalin when he came back. Um, to France, you know, that he was not to cause any trouble. And Torres comes back and starts lecturing the French communists on, it's back to work in the factories, we don't want to have any trouble. And, you know, the French communists are s listening to him with their mouths open in horror. You know, what's happened? I mean, de Gaulle was quite clever in many respects, wasn't he? Mm. he I mean, the, the, the arrival in Bayou with the suitcases full of money and, yes. uh, you know this story better than I do. Talk a bit about that. Well, he, he managed to get, um, uh, shall we say, his entourage of 28 people. They turned up at Portsmouth, ready to be put on um, uh, the destroyer to bit sail over. He to was supposed to have six or something like that. He was supposed to have six, mm -hmm. and then they, this huge retinue appeared. Um, what they were was a way of getting around the veto of uh, President Roosevelt, who did not want to have the French running uh, the civilian uh, authorities in France. As far as he was concerned, it should be AMGOT. Now, AMGOT standing for the Allied Military Government of Occupied Territory. And for de Gaulle, the idea that France should be an occupied territory uh, meant it put it more or less into a sort of enemy category rather than uh, allowing the provisional government of the French Republic, uh, which they had announced, but Roosevelt refused to acknowledge, uh, as basically the uh, authority in place. And this is why with that particular group, he had his so-called Commissaire de la République, who were going to be starting to run and take over, really, from the sort of Vichy authorities and to run France to prevent, again, a communist takeover. This is one of our, uh, this is an opportunity for us to acknowledge one of our, um, our predecessors in writing about Normandy, uh, Cornelius Ryan. And uh, Anton and I have talked about Cornelius Ryan before. Ryan was a, a, an Irishman born in 1920 in Dublin. Uh, the reason I'm thinking about it a lot is that the uh, Library of America, which brings out uh, very fine uh, bound volumes, anthologies of, uh, of great American writers. If you're published by Library of America with those black covers, you know you've made it. And uh, in May, they're bringing out an anthology of Cornelius Ryan. So as a, uh, as a young man, he went to London to make his fortune from Dublin, ended up as a uh, newspaper journalist, and was actually in an airplane, uh, a war plane, over Normandy on June 6, 1944, and covered uh, the, the American Third Army, in particular Patton's Army, uh, as it worked its way across uh, Europe uh, for the rest of the war. And then he emigrated to the United States, and he went to work for Collier's Magazine, which was the place to be if you liked writing uh, narrative long form. And he became a significant and successful mm -hmm magazine writer uh, and had the last cover story on Collier's when it folded in 1956. He'd done some very fine war reporting. Uh, he was uh, with the Americans when they went to arrest Tojo in Tokyo, for example, in, uh, in 1946. <laughs> One of the great dispatches from any correspondent through the whole war, Tojo shot himself in the chest in an attempt to commit suicide missed his heart. Ryan is there taking notes and feeling Tojo's pulse, <laughs> <laughs> taking notes, feeling his pulse. Three hours for an ambulance to get there, Tojo survived long enough to uh, be sewed up and then hanged. <laughs> uh, it's a brilliant dispatch. So anyway, when Collier's folds, Ryan's out of a job. He's living in, uh, in New York at the time and goes back to something that had you know, never left him, and that was the Battle of Normandy. And he began researching the battle, 
by putting ads in newspapers. Were you there? Were you there? And if uh, he got a response that seemed interesting from a soldier, and he put these ads in German papers, British papers, Canadian, American, if he got a response that was interesting, then he would research the person further. He would go and interview them. Reader's Digest began to underwrite his efforts. And he put together a book that was called The Longest Day, published in 1959, an enormous bestseller. Millions of copies sold, ultimately tens of millions of copies sold. Uh, kind of revived interest in D-Day. Um, then he went on to write, uh, he was going to write five books. He had a pentology he was going to write about the, uh, the European campaign. He only lived long enough to write two of them. One on... No, three. Uh, three one. of them, but two more. After oh, sorry, two more. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, one on, on Arnhem, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, A Bridge Too Far. You pick it up there. Well, the, uh, before that, of course, he did the book on uh, the Battle of Berlin. Yeah. Um, and it, it, in fact, it's an extraordinarily good book. He was actually given access to some of the Soviet archives at a time when no other researcher was. But of course, they were, shall we say, heavily selected for him. Uh, at yes. the time. But even so, he, he still managed to sort of s see through quite a lot of the propaganda, uh, especially when it was a question of, say, the mass rapes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so there was uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, new information, information there. Uh, the trouble was, though, that he was already dying of cancer by the time he started to write A Bridge Too Far. Um, and I think that was, that was really one of the sort of the sad sides about it. I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to him because he had one of the best teams of researchers I think any uh, um, historian has ever assembled. And such a richness of material, which, most of which he never used at all. And it's all sitting there in, um, Ohio, in University. Uh, Ohio University, in uh, University of Ohio in Athens, Ohio. Um, and it's simply staggering. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm deeply grateful to Rick, who kept on sort of kicking me, saying, you don't understand quite how important that, that research material is. And so um, that's why I spent um, a certain amount of time in the Holiday Inn in Ohio. <laughs> the British accent goes a long way in Athens, Ohio, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, in, you know, we won't linger on, on Ryan any longer, but he's a heroic character in the sense that he's diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And um, it's advanced to the stage that he's really not going to survive it. He uh, is spending a lot of his time flying around the country looking for salvation. He comes to Stanford, for example, to, to see doctors at Stanford. He's down at Duke. And all the while, he's trying to get this book done, partly because he's got an advance that he's burning through. He's really worried about money at this mm -hmm. point. Because of the success of The Longest Day, everyone will talk to him. He's the most famous mm -hmm. war uh, uh, writer in the world, certainly at that point. And yet he's terribly sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, years go by, and he's written very little. And he knows that the trajectory we're now talking about, what year was that published, Anthony? Sorry, Se I'm not very good on 74. Um, yes, yes, something like that. 70, yeah. 73 or 74. Anyway, so it's the early 70s, and he knows his days are numbered. Mm. And he pulls himself together with this great burst of uh, creativity, and his work ethic was extraordinary. At this point, he's writing in, in uh, Connecticut, and finishes the book mm. just before he dies. And it comes out, and it's a big success again. As you correctly point out, it's got flaws in it. Uh, but it's, in a, it's a tour de force just as... Uh, uh, as uh, it's an extraordinary achievement. Yeah, yeah, it is. Absolutely. So, so um, we'll yap some more, but uh, let's turn to questions or comments you've got. Yes, sir. We'll repeat the question so you can hear it in the back. Did you say the Third Army was involved in the invasion of No, no. no. No, no. No, I didn't say that. He said, did I say the Third Army was involved in the invasion of Normandy? Patton's Third Army was created... Uh, Activated on the 1st of August. Yep. On the 1st of August, yeah. As he correctly points out, Patton, Patton, of course, had run into trouble earlier. He had slapped two soldiers on two successive Sundays in August 1943 in Sicily. Uh, the story remained... The reporters knew about it. 
partly because the physicians in yes. Sicily and the nurses and others in those hospitals were so angry at what they had seen, this despicable behavior by the commanding general, uh, that they were yapping to everybody about it. But the reporters for, you know, basically at Eisenhower's request, kept quiet. And it was not until November, several months after the slapping incident, that the story came out in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and Patton at that point was uh, shoved aside. He was lucky he was not sent home. So Patton was not involved in the invasion in June of 1944. What he was involved in was part of an extraordinarily elaborate deception scheme run by, largely by the British, who have a genius for deception. <laughs> <laughs> Perfide Albion. <laughs> well, it's true. This is all part of, and it's a terribly important part of the whole of the plan of Overlord, of uh, uh, um, Fortitude, Plan Fortitude, yeah. uh, which was to pretend that there was this one army from Scotland going across to Norway, because they knew that Hitler was obsessed with Norway. Funny enough, both Hitler and uh, Churchill were obsessed with Norway for different reasons in a uh, mm -hmm. in an interesting sort of mirror image. Um, and the other one, of course, was FUSAG, the first US army group uh, commanded by Patton. And this was a brilliant mixture of uh, fake radio signals and uh, dummy tanks and all the rest of it done uh, up and down the east coast of England and so forth. It was all notional. There was no FUSAG. No, there was no FUSAG. But the very fact was that the Germans could not believe um, that any army could uh, do without Patton when he was obviously the most sort of uh, uh, brilliant general as far as they were concerned. Um, and they, they couldn't believe that he wouldn't be involved in the operation. So, I mean, he was the ideal person to leave, lead this uh, or command this sort of totally uh, fictitious uh, operation. But the other thing, though, of course, the, the other way he blotted his copy, but was that um, I think it was in Chester, Chester, Chester or whatever, in Cheshire, he made this speech um, thinking that uh, everybody would be happy with it, saying that, uh, um, of course, after the war, the Americans and the British are going to run the world. And he thought the British would be very pleased about that. But needless to say, of course, the Soviets were absolutely furious. No. And so uh, he, he, got, uh, he got slapped down rather heavily for that. That's right. Yeah. Another question, sir. Could you hear him in the back there? Is that a yes? OK, good. Um, well, we were both at the 70th. Yes. And uh, you can only hope that you have the kind of weather we had on June 6, 2014, because it was one of the most gloriously beautiful days in the history of France. Uh, yeah. Well, the 65th anniversary was pretty good, and this was the time when uh, Barack Obama suddenly decided to come over, which no people, nobody had expected, and then everybody got uh, terribly excited about it. In fact, the British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, uh, got so overexcited that in his speech he started referring to Obama Beach instead of Omaha Beach. <laughs> 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 and at the 70th, Obama was there, and President Hollande was there, and they, they both spoke very well. I think they yes. both rose to the occasion. Mm. Um, in terms of other books, um, needless to say, there are hundreds of oh, them. Yeah. Uh, one of the finest unsung uh, writers about uh, the Normandy campaign is a guy named Joseph Balkowski. Yeah. Uh, Joe Balkowski lives in Baltimore. He has written, um, I think, four or five books, mm. Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, yeah. Beyond the Beaches. Mm -hmm. um, he's an exceptionally careful uh, scrupulous, very well researched, yeah. very well researched uh, writer. So I would start with Balkowski and uh, our close mutual friend Max Hastings. You yes. can rarely go wrong reading Max. Uh, Except Max, though, is sometimes people would say that he's sort of uh, too respectful about the German army and too devastating about sort of the British and the American armies. Well, uh, yes. Um, and he, no, I mean, he has a certain point, and I think it's quite important to understand what were uh, the weaknesses. But there is a very big difference between, of course, the armies of democracies and the armies of dictatorships. And I mean, one of the things which I was very struck by was when one reads the 
uh, details of American and British psychiatrists at the end of the war and the way that they were so struck by the, way, by the, the fact that uh, so many of the German prisoners who had suffered far worse uh, from bombardments than, say, British or American troops uh, in terms of the intensity both of artillery and of uh, and bombing, um, and yet they suffered a much lower rate of PTSD, of uh, combat fatigue or whatever. And they were, to see their sort of writing pr immediately post-war on the subject is very, very interesting. And uh, uh, anyway, their conclusions were that actually Hitler had been psychologically preparing the country for war uh, in a way ever since 1933. Um, and basically the British and American armies were essentially um, civilian armies in uniform. And the mentality was bound to be rather different in that particular way. They were simply not prepared for the sort of horrors which they were going to encounter. And the treatment of what we today call PTSD, which had become quite sophisticated in the First World War, uh, those uh, medical advances and the mm. psychiatric advances had been completely forgotten between the wars. Yes. And so the Americans, and I think the British to some extent also, had to invent it again. They had to yes, discover. They start again from the beginning. They did. And so they learned, among other things, that in many cases combat exhaustion is exhaustion and that it requires uh, knocking a soldier out for several days in a quiet place yes. and letting him sleep it off. Now that didn't always, in fact, didn't usually get them back, if it was an infantryman, back into the front lines, but it salvaged him to some extent. So there were many lessons that had been learned that had been forgotten that had to be relearned again. In Normandy especially, yes. In, in Normandy. Yeah. I, on, the, in, on the issue of Max, let's pick up, let's, let's pick on Max for well, a minute. Very, uh, one, sorry, one figure I put in, I mean it is striking, there were about 30,000 psychological uh, casualties in the American forces in Normandy alone. And a million in the whole war. Yes. A million psychological casualties. And that's from, and the, you know this had been called shell shock in, in World War I. By World War II it's a little more sophisticated. They're talking about neuropsychiatric injuries and so on. Mm. But uh, when you talk about the, the, the great range and the, the, the depth of casualties, uh, remembering the psychological damage is... So on, uh, the argument has been going on for years, decades now, uh, and, and, and Max would argue, I think, that when one American battalion or one American regiment fought a German battalion or a German regiment, the Germans were usually better in this kind of mano a mano mm -hmm. contest. Uh, and there were and a number of good reasons for that in a way, because, I mean, actually, the German um, system was far more flexible. Um, I mean, the British, the, the Americans were better than the British, but I mean, I'm afraid the British also had this uh, um, chain of command, a rigidity, uh, a lack of, uh, in, in many ways, a lack of imagination, and also um, the way that the Germans used their NCOs in a far more effective way um, uh, than, the, than the British. I am, you know, there are a whole lot of sort of issues and um, aspects that one can uh, go into on why the German system was often better. Um, and the other one, of course, which were both the British and the Americans were so bad at at that particular stage of the war, was the whole replacement system which was of these poor boys being brought in, yeah. um, um, utterly untrained. I mean, the guys who had actually gone in across the beaches on the 6th of June uh, had been put under fire, they'd been prepared them in every particular way, but it was the ones coming later who were literally just thrown in, unprepared and unexpected. As individuals. As individuals. They had not been trained as units. Yes. And when you're trained as a unit, you develop an esprit and you're going to die for the man on your left, the man on your right. When you arrive as an individual and you're thrown into a unit where you don't know anybody and you've not seen them before, much less trained with them before, uh, it was a catastrophic system. Yes, and the veterans, those who survived, actually shunned the new arrivals. They didn't want to have anything to do with them because they knew they'd be the first to, kill, to be killed. Yeah, they'll uh, make mistakes and they'll get other people killed. Yeah. The answer to, just to finish picking on Max for a moment, the answer to the, the <laughs> issue about the one German battalion versus an American battalion, this mano a mano, so what? So what? That's not what w global war is about. It's about uh, many larger issues, including the capacity to orchestrate the enormous logistical needs of waging global war. So, uh, yes, you can concede that the Germans had a certain uh, tactical and operational brilliance, mm -hmm. and yet 7 million dead Germans, 50 German cities obliterated, country destroyed, country divided. So what if they had good battalions? Mm. 
excuse. It meant nothing in the long run. There's a question in the back. Yes, sir. Um, it could have done. I mean, as Rommel said, I mean, as you know, um, Rommel was the one who came up with the phrase the longest day because he knew that actually the whole thing would be decided on the very first day. Um, you know, there were swings and roundabouts and uh, when one looked at the conditions, the weather conditions, the way that that actually uh, had advantages and disadvantages, there was that very high tide um, which made it very difficult, for example, for the British to get their tanks off the beaches. Um, and, but the main thing is, if they had had their panzer divisions forward, to what degree would the uh, Allied fighter bombers have been able to intervene? That was the main thing. Um, and, the, you know, the visibility that day was not great, but uh, they probably still would have uh, been, been, been used. I'm, I'm afraid, you know, it's, it's a counterfactual. Um, it, it's absolutely impossible to know uh, the answer to that one. Yeah, that's right. I can't answer that any better. Yes, ma'am, you had a question here. <laughs> she, she, yeah, yeah. I think is that, it, is that the, it creeps up on you. It, it does it. creep up. On you. She, she said she's been uh, interested in the kind of writing life and the, the, the process. Did we just get up one day and decide to devote 20 to 30 years of our lives to this? Uh, for me, it was only 15. So, um, uh, no, I'm a bit older than you. So, um, <laughs> no, I, I suppose I started. Uh, well, I started in the 1970s, um, and. Uh, you know, you, you, quite often you, you don't decide necessarily yourself. Sometimes it has to be um, your, your publishers will always pay you a lot more money if it's their idea rather than your idea. Uh, they'll give you, a, on the whole, tend to give you a much larger advance. So I had actually not started uh, writing in that particular way. It was only when they said, well, because of your military background, why don't you uh, write more military history? And so that was why I suddenly found myself and then got more and more fascinated by it. Um, you can't really predict. Uh, it's a very strange career, to put it mildly. My eldest brother said, well, it's not a proper job. <laughs> and in a way, I suppose he's right. <laughs> I suppose he is. Well, in my case, uh, I'd worked in the newspaper world for a long time. I worked at the Washington Post, and I'd gone away from, uh, from my day job to write books, always about military history, uh, some military topic. Uh, and in... Um, God, I can't even remember when it was. It was 20 years ago, I guess. Uh, I'm looking for a, a story. I'm looking for a subject to write as a book. And um, it, it occurred to me, why not take... I'd lived in Berlin for three years. I was born in Germany. I've always had a personal... My father was a career infantry officer. I uh, uh, had, had been in Europe in World War II. Uh, and it just occurred to me, uh, you know... When I lived in Berlin, I had two small epiphanies that I think were important. One was that um, World War II, like all great events, like all great uh, humans, is bottomless. People will be writing about World War II 500 years from now, and hopefully they'll be reading about it 500 years from now. In the same way, people will be writing about Lincoln 500 years from now. And so it occurred to me when in the mid-90s when I was there in, uh, in Berlin uh, that um, the, the, there was still much more to write. And the other little epiphany I had was that uh, the, the campaign in Western Europe, at least, didn't begin at Normandy. It began in Africa, which is where the liberation of Europe began with the Anglo-American invasion, November 8, 1942, and that campaign for seven months to, to clear the North African shore, and then moved 100 miles across the Mediterranean to Sicily, and then into southern Italy, and I suddenly recognize that there's a trilogy here. It's a trilogy. It's a triptych, three panels. And I was influenced by Bruce Catton. I was influenced by Shelby Foote, both of whom wrote trilogies. So it all just kind of fell together for me, and the next thing you know, 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sir. And this one. Yeah. What was that? Uh, say it again. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 
Well, you've got a Sandhurst grad here who can answer that. Well, at Sandhurst, where I studied under John Keegan, um, indeed, one studied it from many uh, different aspects. In fact, one of our um, one of our other professors there had actually been one of the commandos landing on on the beaches. So one certainly had, if you like, the uh, <coughs> the personal account uh, just as well as, if you like, the strategic overview. And I think one of the important things, and that's one of the great developments of military history writing. I mean, as the great Professor Sir Michael Howard, to whom we all bow down, um, emphasized that, you know, military history rather more lies in the past. I thank goodness now it's much more the history of war, uh, which includes, which includes, of course, the suffering of civilians and those caught up in the middle. Um, and I think it's terribly important to uh, see both war from above and war from below. Uh, and this was actually John Keegan's great contribution in his book, The Face of Battle, uh, was to actually just start seeing it entirely as the way that a general or staff officer liked the top-down view and trying to look at it as a sort of almost as a chessboard, but also to recognize the way that the chaos, the fear, the smoke um, was really the, the true experience of soldiers uh, rather than this idea of being moved around, moved around by a sort of, you know, grandmaster of uh, military strategy. Yeah, and th at West Point, just to add on to that, uh, Today, the, 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 I mean, at West Point teaches history in general very well, I think. Uh, they have a, a wonderful chairman of the history department, a, a fabulous colonel named Ty Sedgley. And uh, if you want to get a feel for Ty Sedgley, his last name is S-E-I-D-U-L-E, -E, and Google him and l watch his five-minute uh, YouTube video on the Civil War. It's had like 20 million views on why the Civil War was about slavery, about defeating slavery. Ty's from Georgia, and he speaks with great authority on this. In, in teaching cadets or midshipmen about war, there's a great emphasis, I think, on uh, learning from mistakes and acknowledging that there are many, many mistakes at all levels, tactical, operational, and strategic, and that one of the things you want your history students to come away with is a recognition of mistakes and trying to build your own mm -hmm. eventual career uh, by learning and not repeating uh, the mistakes of others earlier. Yeah, so. and the real victor, the real victor is the one who lets the enemy make his mistakes and not interfere. Oh, that's <laughs> right, right. Uh, yes, yes, sir. He asked about, could you hear him in the back? He, he, he said with journalists, guys like A.J. Liebling, who was in Paris the day after, he was actually in Paris the day it was liberated. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of very fine journalists who were in Paris on that day. Mm -hmm. And how important was it for the military to embed these reporters? It was a kind of embedding, certainly at that time, uh, to, to the cause. Well, I can answer that very briefly in that, uh, you know, I think the greatest generation is nonsense, with all due respect to my close friend Tom Brokaw, <laughs> greater than the founding fathers, greater than the Civil War generation. But they were the greatest generation of reporters. Mm -hmm. They were fabulous. And as a longtime journalist, I revere them. Uh, but they operated under certain constraints. They're in uniform. They're in the chain of command. They're subject to extreme censorship. They cannot tell anything that's really going on doesn't mean that there wasn't fine journalism done. A lot of it was done after the fact, mm -hmm. where they go back and they empty out their notebooks and they write, you know, accounts afterward. So, uh, you know, I think it was important to the military in the way it has often been important to the military in the sense that this is a propaganda arm. That the, you know, the journalists are uh, in service of the cause at the time. Uh, they recognize that, and many of them bridled at the notion, but uh, that's the way it was then. It, that changed with Vietnam, and it will never be the same again. I agree, absolutely. Sir, we got, uh, we got time for maybe two more.
You're joking to me or Anthony? To, to me. <laughs> um, you know, the, certainly those ships were, they were stacked to the gunnels with stuff. There were disasters. One of the greatest disasters was before D-Day. It was at Slapton Sands. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a training exercise. Admiral Moon, I referred to earlier, the guy who blew his brains out in Naples. One of the reasons he was suffering was because he'd been in command at Slapton Sands. It was in April 1944. Security was lax. Uh, German attack boats got in among the convoy and uh, torpedoed several ships and um, bodies, they were American bodies mostly, washed ashore at Slapton Sands uh, by the hundreds. Mm. They lost more troops at Sands from Sta on Slapton Sands than they did on Utah Beach. Uh, so that taught them one thing about security, but also, uh, you know, I would say that the, uh, the, the loading in general for D-Day while there were, a, there were problems, there's no doubt about that, in general, it was quite well done. I think it was. I think it was. We're out of time, I'm we're told. Out of time. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.